Thank you, ladies. What a great truth. Our chains indeed are gone because of what Christ did at the cross for us. If you have God's Word, if you turn with me to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. For those of you who haven't been with us long, uh, we are taking a passage of Scripture from every chapter in Proverbs. And... Uh, because there's godly wisdom for daily life. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. And I don't know about you guys, but I really need God's wisdom every day. Uh, I find my own wisdom, it, it falls woefully short of what I need to live in an ungodly world, an ungodly age in which we find ourselves. So if you find Proverbs chapter 5, if you turn with me to verse 21. Verse 21 of Proverbs chapter 5. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts to hear what you need to say to us today. But Father, I pray that this will not just be an effort in hearing, but Father, it will be an effort in faith where we respond, Lord, to what you ask us to do. Lord, speak clearly to our hearts today and change us. And Lord, we pray that and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the favorite stories for most guys in the Bible is the story of Samson. Samson was probably the strongest person that's ever lived on this planet. Samson lived and was born during a time when there grew up a generation of people, as the Bible says, that did not know the Lord. Isn't it sad? The generation before them were the ones that God had brought out of Egypt and placed in the promised land. Now y'all remember the stories if you've read the Bible. God did some great miracles, did He not? To get them there. And so shortly afterwards, those parents failed to pass on these truths to their children. And so there grew up a generation that didn't know the Lord. And the book of Judges described the people like this. There was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in his or her own eyes. Does that not fit our generation today? Is that not just an apt description of where we find ourselves? When God is not allowed to be king, people do whatever they want to do, whatever's right in their own eyes. Samson was a special person. An angel came to his parents and told them that Samson was to be a special person. That he was to be set aside unto God, he was to take a Nazarite vow. And that's what that means, literally. A Nazarite vow were the outward symbols of an inward commitment to be God's man. One of the things that he had to do was not cut his hair. That was a symbol. It was, his strength didn't come from his hair, folks. His strength came from his commitment to the Lord, his calling from God. But when Samson grew up, he forsook the way of the Lord. He started doing things the way he wanted to do them. And God still worked through him in a mighty way, but he was not able to do all of what he could have done through Samson had Samson been totally yielded to God's will. Samson was to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines, one of their enemies. And what does Samson do? He falls in love with a prostitute from Philistia. And so he was seeing her, spending time with her, and the people of the Philistine army, some of the leaders of the Philistines, paid her a handsome sum of money if she could discover the source of his strength. Well, two times she asked him, and he lied to her. And he was bound by her, and when the Philistines came in, he easily broke the bounds, the bonds, and was able to overcome the Philistines. Now you think Samson would have been wise enough to say, this woman is trying to lead me astray. And yet he was not thinking with his spiritual mind and his dedication to God, he was thinking in the flesh. 
And she hounded him day after day after day. Until finally Samson said, Okay, if you want to know the secret of my strength, it's in my hair. Now that wasn't the truth. His secret of his strength was in God. But he had gotten so far away from God that he... And I wish there was one English word that describes his attitude. There's a good word in Spanish, mano preciar. And, and I know y'all don't know what that means, but let me see if I can explain it to you. Basically what he did was he treated as nothing his commitment to God. He despised, if you will, his calling from God. And because he did that, when she bound him this time, he jumped up to go out to break his bonds as he'd done before to attack the Philistines. And it's the saddest scripture to me in all the Old Testament. This is what he says. And the, the narrator of that passage of scripture says this. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Think about that for just a minute. How can you get so far away from God that you don't even know when He leaves and closes the door? They put out His eyes and eventually it led to His death. You know, we live in a day and time. Samson was ensnared by his own sin. And we, we live in a day and time, or do we not? When sin is running rampant in our country, when sin is rampant, running rampant even in the church of God's people, Proverbs chapter 5 describes the heartbreaking results primarily of sexual sins. I'm just going to run through that real quick. Basically, Solomon describes the personal results in verses 7 through 9. There's a loss of honor and uh, your life wastes away because of your sin. He describes the emotional results in verses 11 through 14. Literally groaning under the weight of sin. You remember what David said when he sinned against God? He said, when I remain silent, my bones literally wasted away through his sin. Solomon goes on to describe the emotional results. 11 through 14, he, he describes the financial results in verse 10. You can't keep up more than one household, can you? Without spending a bunch of money. And that's the point he's trying to say. A person comes to financial ruin because of sexual sin. He also talks about the professional results in verses 13 through 14. A loss of respect from your peers and those you work with. He talks about the social results in verses 3 through 5 and 14. A loss of respect and loss of your friends. Any of those reasons should be enough to dissuade us from committing sexual sins. But guys, what you and I need to understand is sexual sins are not the only sins out there. They're sins of all different kind. God's Word tells us we need to avoid all sins. Why? Well, what does the Scripture here tell us? First of all, it tells us we ought to avoid sin because God sees our ways. God sees our ways. Have you ever heard the old saying, be sure your sins will find you out? I know y'all have heard that saying before. Well, it's true. And the reason why, it's not your sins that are going to find you out. It's God that's going to find you out. God sees all things. Listen to these verses of Scripture. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Jeremiah 23. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth? declares the Lord. Psalm 44, 21, For He, God, knows the secrets of the hearts. Psalm 90, verse 8, You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You know what all those verses tell me? There's not one thought that we can think, and there's not one action that we, cannot, that we perform. It doesn't matter if it's in the deepest, darkest cavern in all the planet. God is there. Folks, God knows past, present, and future equally as well. He knows every thought that you have in your mind and in your heart. He knows every action that you commit. God knows all things. And not only that, every sin that we commit always interrupts our fellowship with God. 
Read Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Write that down somewhere and you can go look at it later. But basically God says, God's arm is not too short that He can't save, and His ear is not too dull that He can't hear, but your sins have separated you from God. Our sins always create separation, whether we're lost or whether we're saved. Sin always separates us from God. God sees everything that we do. God hates sin, folks. God is holy. And the Bible says without holiness you cannot see God. You cannot get out of this world in any satisfactory condition without holiness. God hates sin. He hates what sin does to His creatures. Now, let me just stop and say here, God does not hate you, okay? If you're caught up and you're enslaved in sin, God does not hate you. He hates what you're doing. He hates what sin is doing to your life because it's destroying the very creature that He created. He's destro it's destroying the one that He created. He, he, God, you literally are God's masterpiece. I like the verse of Scripture in Ephesians where it says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good work. That word workmanship literally means God's poem. We're God's poem. We're God's masterpiece. Every one of us. You all. Every person on this planet is valuable to God. But God hates what sin does to us. God hates it so much that He was willing to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross. He, Jesus came to this earth and lived a sinless life in order that He might be our substitute on the cross. Folks, every one of us should have been hang, hung on the cross. Every one of us should experience the wrath of God because God always pours out wrath on sin. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He came and He lived a sinless life that He might take our place on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. God is the all-seeing one. There's nothing that you and I can do. You know, you may think to yourself, sin is no big deal. It's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting me. It's not hurting anybody else. But folks, God sees your sin and God hates sin because of what it does to you. So one reason why we should avoid sin is because God sees us. Sin is such a bad issue. That, a few weeks ago on a Sunday night, I preached about uh, adultery. And how it destroys a person's life. You remember what Jesus said in that passage. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Because it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Now, we know that God created our bodies. And God doesn't want us to do harm to our bodies because they're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what Jesus is saying, sin is such a problem that we need to take radical steps to get it out of our life. Folks, sin is bad, and God sees it all. Second reason why we ought to avoid sin is because our sins ensnare us. The picture is of a person making a trap to catch somebody else or something else. You ever made a trap to catch a squirrel? My grandfather uh, taught me how to make a trap to catch a squirrel. But the picture is a person building this trap... And they themselves get trapped in their own trap. That's what the word ensnare means. Our sins ensnare us. I like the way he, he describes it here. They, they tie us down. It reminds me of the Gulliver Travels and the Lilliputians and, and them tying him down to the ground. Y'all remember that with all the cords? Some of y'all read that story lately. You see, our sins tie us down. They ensnare us. Samson was ensnared by his own sin. Because he preferred to live a sinful lifestyle rather than being obedient to God and doing what God had called him to do. He was ensnared by his own sin and eventually lost his life because of it. Solomon was ensnared by his sins, the guy that wrote this book. Solomon had, what was it, 700 wives and 300 concubines? Guys, I don't know about y'all, but I can't handle but one woman. I can't imagine having a thousand. <laughs> But you know what the Bible says about, about Solomon? His wives led his heart away from the Lord. He was ensnared by his own sinfulness. Jesus said it this way, He who sins is a slave of sin. 
Other Bible passages, folks, can concur with this particular observation of Jesus. Proverbs 12, 13, An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips. Proverbs 29, 6, An evil man is ensnared in his transgression. Hebrews 12, 1, very known, well-known passage. Listen to what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You know, isn't that true? Doesn't our sin easily ensnare us? Isn't it a whole lot harder to do what God wants you to do? We easily get distracted, don't we, by sin. We easily get drug in. We're like a fish. Oh, BJ, you like to fish, don't you? What you try to do? Make that lure enticing so that bass can't resist it, right? That's exactly what we see sin. We see sin and it ensnares us. It looks appetizing. It looks like something that's fun. And so we latch on to it only to realize we've been caught in the trap and we become enslaved to sin. But you don't really need the Bible to tell you that. You know from personal experience, don't you? If you've ever tried to quit smoking, you know how much it's enslaved you. If you've ever tried to quit taking drugs, you realize you take the drugs because they think you make you feel better, but before long, you're enslaved to it. You've got to have it. You're enslaved by your own sin. Or, or what about overeating? Uh oh, I don't quit preaching, going to meddling now. <laughs> or, or what about gossiping? I, I know some people that just live for gossip. From the time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed, that's all they think about is gossip. Oh, we don't call it gossip, we call it prayer request. You need to pray for so and so, they're doing this, that, and the other. What you're doing is you're really gossiping about people. It's, en it's enslaving, is it not? Does it not enslave you? Is it, is it a habit that's hard to break once you start down that road? Or what about perfectionism? That's probably my biggest problem right there. I'm a perfectionist. I know I am. Ask my wife. She can tell you. Folks, that's the sin. It, it enslaves you. You can't enjoy life because you think everything's got to be in its place. And all. Folks, sin enslaves us. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. Why is it we keep doing it? Why should we avoid sins? It's because God sees everything that we do. And secondly, because our sins create a trap that we can't get out of. It ensnares us. Lastly, notice what this passage says. The third reason why we ought to avoid sin is because we can die from a lack of discipline. We can die from a lack of discipline. Living a morally undisciplined life results in death. Sometimes it's a living death, at other times it's a physical and spiritual death. I've dealt with people who have contracted AIDS because of their sinful lifestyle. And that is a tragic sight to see. I can take you right now to some people I know that are living an openly homosexual lifestyle. Just look at them. They're wasting away to nothing. Their sin is literally destroying them. Folks, the reason why you and I need to avoid sin is because sin destroys us. What causes us to become enslaved to our own sin? According to Solomon here in verse 23, we die because of great folly. It's because of our great folly that we're led astray. The word folly appears 21 times in Proverbs. It's the opposite of wisdom. It describes a philosophy or perspective of life based only on human intellect and experiences without considering God. In other words, we commit sin because we think it makes sense or it makes us feel good. We want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But we forget the part that they're only for a season, that there are consequences to our sinfulness. It's folly to think about that. It's folly not to consider God. The foolish person is the one who is thoughtless, who is self-centered, who is obviously indifferent to God. It is our folly that leads us to a lack of discipline. It's characterized by thoughtlessness in the way we live our lives. It's characterized by unbridled passions 
And it's characterized by a lifestyle of envy, greed, and pride. In Matthew chapter 27, or 23, folly is equated with spiritual blindness, which is exactly what Paul tells us over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, when he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but for those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know what's a great mystery to me? It's why any person would neglect their soul. Just think about it like this for just a, for a second. If you had a disease and you knew that a doctor could give you the cure, would you not go to the doctor to get the cure for your disease? Would that not be the smart thing to do? And yet we know that sin separates us from God and the soul that sins will certainly die. And that's not just talking about physical death, it's talking about spiritual death. But there is a cure. There's a name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. It is the cross of Christ where Jesus paid the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven. That brings us back into a right relationship with God. And it is folly just to ignore that, to act like we're going to live forever and that we're never going to have to face Almighty God. Folly plunges us headlong into sin and can eventually lead to living death or even a premature death. I've known people that have so got in God's way of doing things that God's removed them from the face of the earth. I can name names. And you say, well, preacher, God doesn't do something like that. God's a God of love. Yes, He's a God of love. If He wasn't a God of love, all of us would be going to hell. But the, the news of the Scripture is that God is also a God of wrath that punishes sin. And for us to ignore that is folly on our part. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his own flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Some of y'all may remember this. Y'all young people won't even know what I'm talking about. There was a commercial back during my day when I was your age, back a teenager. It was a Fram oil filter commercial. And the line was this, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. You know the sad tragedy of sin, sometimes we pay now and then we also pay later. It's not either or, sometimes it's both and. Now I've seen God miraculously save somebody and as a part of that saving heal them. Heal them from a drug addiction, heal them from a physical illness. God can do that. But I've also seen God save people and not take away the physical consequences of their sin, sins that they committed in the past. Even the Apostle Paul, who walked with God, had what? A thorn in the flesh. Nobody knows what it was. But God said, I'm not going to take that away from you. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul had to depend on the grace of God to get through the rest of his life because if he had a problem in his heart and his life. Guys, sin creates separation from God. And sin always brings about God's wrath. And sin eventually will lead you to be judged by the Almighty God. God not only hates sin, but God will eventually judge sin. This is what the Scripture says. On, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Folks, God judges sin. Sin can lead to death. If our sin is unforgiven, and I mean in the sense of you're, you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that judgment from God will be eternal separation in a place called hell, where you can't get away from God. The Bible says that God will literally pour forth his, the fury of His wrath on the people in hell. Now, we don't want to hear about that, do we? We like to hear about the big God being the God of love. 
Now we like to hear about the fact that, that we can be involved in the pleasures of sin for a season and then have our, our sins forgiven and everything's okay. We don't want to hear about the fact that sometimes our sin leads to our death. But it's the truth that's found in the Word of God if you'll simply read it for yourself. My challenge to you today is don't let your life be ensnared by sin. Paul told the Galatian church, he said it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I see so many Christians who allow themselves, they have, they have the power of the Spirit, they, have, they are called the son and the daughter of God, but they allow sin to enslave them all over again. And it's tragic because you don't have to live that way. The Bible says as believers in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living in us that empowers us to walk a life that is pleasing unto God. And Jesus said it this way, If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. You'll be really free. Folks, God can deliver you from the power and the penalty of sin if you'll allow Him to do that. Have you been ensnared by your own sins? Why should you avoid sin? Because God sees everything you're doing and He hates what sin is doing to you. Secondly, your sin ensnares you. You may think you're fine. You may think sin is no big deal. It's not hurting anybody but you. But sin always brings separation. And lastly, why should you avoid sin? It's because an undisciplined life can lead to your death. Premature death or eternal death, whichever or both happens. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to a time of invitation, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit as He deals with hearts this morning. Lord, would be our judge as to whether or not we're enslaved to sin or not. And Father, I pray that none of us will remain in our sin today, but will confess it to You and find forgiveness. Or Father, we will accept Your plan, the Lord Jesus Christ who has dealt with our sin problem. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in such a powerful way that lives would be changed in this place today. Lord, I pray it and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you've never put your faith or trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me. There, I, I talked about the bad news here this morning, but let me tell you about the good news. The good news is God loves you. He doesn't love the sin and what sin's doing to you, but He loves you. And God made a provision so that you don't have to die in your sin. Your chains can be gone this morning. You can be set free. You don't have to live enslaved to sin. You don't have to live under the wrath of the hand of God. Your sins can be forgiven. If you will put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today, the Bible says you shall be saved. Not maybe, not might, but you shall be saved. In just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. And when we do, I'm just going to ask you to come and take my hand and say, Pastor, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. If you'll do that, God will forgive your sins. I, I still remember the day I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was 10 years old. And I still remember it to this day. It felt like the greatest weight had been lifted off of my heart and off of my life. It was just indescribable. God can do that for you today. If you'll confess your sins to Him and ask Him to forgive you and to come in your life to be your Lord and Savior. And my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how many of us are still enslaved to sin? Christ set you free so you could be free not to be enslaved to sin all over again. Why, why do you let sin get a foothold in your life? Do you not understand that sin will ultimately destroy you? Sin will ultimately move you further away from God, not closer to God. And one of the things that we ought to want to do is to be close to God. As believers in Christ, oftentimes we live below our position. Do you understand that you are a son 
or a daughter of the living God. The one who has all power in heaven and earth. Your sin is no problem for God. If you'll ask Him to forgive you, He is faithful and just to forgive you. And He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And even more importantly than that, He'll give you the power not to be enslaved by sin any longer. But you've got to want it. You've got to want to live a life that's pleasing unto God. You've got to want to get rid of that sin that's in your heart. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a little sin or a big sin, does it? Actually, God doesn't have any categories. Sin is sin. You and I are the ones that have categories. We're the ones that say, oh, this is just a little white lie or this is just a little sin. It's not really a big sin. Folks, all sin is bad because it separates us from God. So all sin is big. So my challenge to you this morning, aren't you tired of it? Aren't you ready just to lay it down and get rid of it? Ask God. Pray to Him. Ask for His power in your life. Because Jesus has set you free not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He set you free so you can be free indeed. And if you'll confess that to God, you'll, you'll sense the peace and the joy in your life that you haven't had in years. If you'll just simply get rid of the sin that's in your life. What's God saying to you this morning? Is there something you need to confess to Him? Maybe you need to come have your pastor pray with you. Maybe you just need to come spread this altar right here. That's why it's here. For you to come pray. But would you do what God is asking you to do? And come as God leads you to come. Let's stand together and sing, Adam.